Thousands of Salvadorans commemorated the 30th anniversary of the end of the Civil War while protesting what they see as attempts by President Nayib Bukele to raise the 1992 peace accords. Russia has reiterated its demand that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization halt its expansion eastward. Palestinians protested in occupied East Jerusalem over a new eviction in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in El Salvador, where thousands of people commemorated the 30th anniversary of the end of the Civil War on Monday while denouncing what they claim are attempts by President Nayib Bukele to raise the peace accords that established the foundations of the country's democracy. President Bukele on Sunday sanctioned a decree to honor victims of the Civil War that the opposition considers a delegitimization of the peace accords that signaled an end to the conflict 30 years ago. The decree approves the move to commemorate the National Day of the Victims of the Armed Conflict on January 16th after the ruling party, which holds a majority in the Legislative Assembly, repealed a decree that established the date as the National Day of Peace. Lawmakers argued that the peace accords represented the signing of a pact by a small circle of power which for years has been a symbol of injustice and social exclusion. But opponents of Bukele, who became president outside the traditional parties, accuse him of wanting to erase the agreements and politically wipe out the two parties that signed the peace accords. After more than six months, the truth about the assassination of Haitian President Jovenel Moïse remains to be known. More than 40 people have been arrested, with the most recent capture this past weekend in Jamaica. Human rights organisations have denounced that the legal investigation in Haiti to find all those responsible for the crime has been blocked. We have more details in the following special report. Joseph John Joel. A former Haitian senator suspected of being a key player in the assassination of the Haitian president was arrested this weekend in Jamaica, where he is presumed to have arrived since December a fugitive from justice. Jovenel Moïse, pouvoir illégal, illégitime Jovenel Moïse, non? John Joel Joseph, a well-known opponent of Jovenel Moïse, is accused by the Haitian police of providing weapons and planning meetings like this one in Florida, where the plot was organized. Antonio Palacios, Palacios. Last October, also in Jamaica, another key link was captured. Former Colombian military officer Mario Antonio Palacios, who was deported to his country after a stopover in Panama, a coordinated action between Colombia and the United States led him to Florida, where he is now accused of conspiring to kill the president of Haiti. The rest of the mercenaries have pointed to Elias Floro as one of those who knew that the real plan was to assassinate Jovenel Moïse. Jean Rodolphe alias Dodolf. Also apprehended last week in the Dominican Republic was the Haitian businessman, convicted drug trafficker and DEA informant Rodolf Jar who in an interview with the New York Times acknowledged his contribution of around $130,000 to provide weapons and lodging to more than 20 Colombian mercenaries. He also alleged that he joined the plot because the conspirators claimed to have the full support of the United States. But according to the Times, there is no evidence of an active connection with the U.S. government. However, in Haiti, the investigation did not look into the financial connections of at least two Haitian banking institutions that received high amounts from the country, of at least six citizens of residents implicated in the assassination. At the time, the FBI raided the house, but no new details have been known about the Ecuadorian-born U.S. citizen Walter Ventimilla, a mortgage and insurance broker who acknowledged that his global capital lending group participated in the financing of a change of government for Haiti but was not part of the assassination. The FBI has also not commented on the legal status of two managers of CTU security registered in Miami as the Federal Academy Counterterrorism Unit. Antonio Intriago, an immigrant of Venezuelan origin, an Arcángel Pretelt, a former member of the Colombian Army, native of Cali and resident in Florida, are accused by the Haitian police of participating in the plot of the crime. According to the Haitian National Network of Human Rights, the investigations to find all those responsible have yet to clarify the links between the current Prime Minister Ariel Henry and former official of the Ministry of Justice, who is said to be responsible 
for coordinating the assassination in real time. Barrio Joseph Feli. Joseph Barrio, still a fugitive, spoke before and after the crime at least 12 times with the current president of Haiti, according to telephone records revealed in September 2021 by the prosecutor Bedford Claude. Dismissed after requesting that the prime minister explain this relationship before the court, some sources assured that four months after the assassination, the fugitive visited the official residence of the prime minister two nights without major obstacles from the security guards. Addressing the virtual World Economic Forum this Monday, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned of the need to vaccinate the whole world in order to end the COVID-19 pandemic. ...have demonstrated a simple but brutal truth. If we leave anyone behind, in the end, we leave everyone behind. If we fail to vaccinate every person, we give rise to new variants that spread across borders and bring daily life and economies to a grinding halt. This coming year, I urge you to focus on three urgent areas. First, we need to confront the pandemic with equity and fairness. Last fall, the World Health Organization unveiled a strategy to vaccinate 40% of people in all countries by the end of last year and 70% by the middle of this year. We are nowhere near these targets. And the UN Secretary General also stressed the need to reform the global financial system and support developing countries. Now, at the core of these failures is a global inability to support developing countries in their hour of need and also a problem of governance for international different systems. Without immediate action to support developing countries, inequalities and poverty will deepen. And this will result in more social unrest and more violence. Second, we need to reform the global financial system in a way that it can work for all countries without being biased. At this critical moment, we are setting in stone a lopsided recovery. More than eight out of 10 recovery dollars are being spent in developed countries. Low-income countries are at a huge disadvantage. The International Labour Organization has warned it could take years for employment levels to reach pre-pandemic levels, while noting the need to work to tackle increased inequality. The COVID-19 crisis is incomplete, uh, it is fragile and it's uneven. So we expect in 2022 uh, that the number of hours actually worked in the global economy uh, will still be considerably below pre-pandemic level. And that's represents effectively the loss of 52 million full-time job equivalents. So we're not even back to the starting point. The rich world, uh, Europe and North America, is getting back to pre-pandemic levels more quickly. Uh, some regions are doing uh, less well. And the uncertainty comes from the fact that we are facing inflationary pressures, supply chain blockages, which means, well, things might continue to improve, but they could also go quite badly wrong as well. What we need to see is a genuine common international effort to pull the world forward uh, from this pandemic. If each country goes its own way, I fear that the great divergence is only going to get worse rather than better. And that's really important in a world which is already suffering, I think, the stresses and strains uh, of increased uh, inequalities. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Russia has reiterated its demand that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization halt its expansion eastward. 
while noting it will not wait indefinitely for a Western response. According to presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov, the deployment of NATO forces and weapons near Russia's borders poses a security threat that must be addressed immediately. At a news conference on Friday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stressed that the United States has been driven by arrogance and has aggravated tensions in violations of its obligations and common sense. Last week's negotiations in Geneva and a related NATO-Russia meeting in Brussels were held amid the significant tensions over Ukraine, while little progress was reported. And Russian authorities again dismissed the United States' accusations of an alleged operation by the Kremlin to invade Ukraine. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov pointed out that Washington spread false information about an alleged false flag attack on the Russian-speaking population in Donbass as an excuse for an occupation of Ukraine. Lavrov stated that what happened in Ukraine in 2014 was not provoked by Russia, but a coup supported and organized by the United States. Moscow has repeatedly ruled out an invasion of the neighboring country and stressed that the tensions stem from the military buildup by Ukraine with the support of NATO. Reports have revealed that the United States Central Intelligence Agency has been overseeing a secret training program for Ukrainian Special Operations Forces and intelligence operatives since 2015. The revelations cite five former intelligence and national security officials. The U.S. officials said the intelligence agency has been supervising the covert training program in preparation for a potential conflict with Russia. The mission has allegedly been underway since 2014 and is based at an undisclosed facility in the southern U.S. The military boot camp has included exercises in firearms, camouflage techniques and land navigation. President of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamat Tokayev, issued a decree dismissing the first deputy head of the National Security Committee on Monday. The presidential press service reported the move to dismiss Samat Abish, the nephew of former President Hanul Sultan Nasabayev, from the post. On January 8th, Kazakhstan Special Services detained the former chair of the National Security Committee, Karim Masimov, accused of high treason in the wake of the violent destabilization attempts that rocked the Central Asian nation in early January. On January 13th, the ex-deputy chairman of the National Security Committee, head of the Special Task Service and the former deputy chairman of the National Security Committee were also detained. Chinese President Xi Jinping called on countries to pull strength to overcome difficulties and challenges while addressing the World Economic Forum during its virtual session on Monday. To meet the severe challenges facing humanity, we must add wings to the tiger and act with the courage and strength of the tiger to overcome all obstacles on our way forward. We must do everything necessary to clear the shadow of the pandemic and boost economic and social recovery and development so that the sunshine of hope may light up the future of humanity. The world today is undergoing major changes unseen in a century. These changes, not limited to a particular moment, event, country or region, represent the profound and sweeping changes of our times. Notwithstanding all vicissitudes, humanity will move on. We need to learn from comparing long history cycles and see the change in the things through the subtle and minute. We need to foster new opportunities amidst crisis, open up new horizons on achieving landscape, and pull great strength to go through difficulties and challenges. Peru's government requested an update on the preventive actions taken in response to rising tides on beaches along the coast, which left two people dead following a volcanic eruption in Tonga. Prime Minister Mitarasque stated the government had requested the Navy report on alerts issued after the eruption. The Prime Minister said there was a disorganised and late reaction to the risks and noted that the executive had taken into account criticism regarding the prevention of disasters. She also emphasised authorities are seeking information to carry out an investigation and, if necessary, there will be sanctions against those responsible. And the Pacific island nation of Tonga was virtually cut off from the rest of the world on Monday after a massive volcanic blast that crippled communications and stalled emergency relief efforts. Two days after the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hahapali volcano exploded, covering Tonga in a film of ash, triggering a Pacific wide tsunami and releasing shockwaves that wrapped around the entire earth, phone lines are still down and an undersea internet cable cut. The true toll of the dual eruption tsunami disaster is not yet known. The island's worried neighbours are still scrambling to grasp the scale of the damage, which New Zealand's leader Jacinda Ardern said was believed to be significant.
Of course, uh, what uh, the Orion is doing is, is a reconnaissance. Uh, it is, as are the Australians, uh, looking to undertake an assessment uh, from the air uh, of the outer islands in particular, uh, and then, of course, provide that information uh, to the people of Tonga and Tongan authorities. Uh, for the C-130, we're, of course, undertaking planning to enable drops to be undertaken regardless of the status of the airport. Ash cloud um, does pose a risk. Um, the view on departure was that they would be able to undertake that, that overflight reconnaissance, though, and provide that really critical information back. Uh, the flights undertaken today uh, will help us establish what needs there might be, as will the ongoing communication with officials on the ground. At the same time, though, we know water is an immediate need, so Hercules will be able to, we hope, um, take off today in order to meet that need much more quickly than our Navy vessels will be able to reach the islands. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Palestinians protested in occupied East Jerusalem over a new eviction in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. A group of Palestinians stood on the roof of the house in the neighborhood that has seen repeated forced evictions by the Zionist regime and vowed to defend the family facing the loss of their home. Scores of Israeli police and riot gear surrounded the property from early on Monday while roads were sealed off around the area. As the afternoon stretched on, Israeli forces backed by bulldozers and special units demolished a plant nursery belonging to the family. At least two Palestinians were arrested as Israeli soldiers assaulted people who had gathered around the house in solidarity with the family. Sheikh Jarrah has become an emblem of the Israeli campaign to forcibly displace Palestinians from East Jerusalem in an internationally condemned practice. The family has lived in this house for decades, but the occupation government issued a decision against this family to forcibly displace it under the false claim that they would like to build a school or a kindergarten for children in this location, and the school will be only for settlers. It's a very complicated situation. Uh, the demolition and the evictions of civilians from occupied territory is a violation of international law, uh, as long as it's not for military necessity. In this instance, we are not seeing any military reasons for any evictions and demolitions, and we call on the Israeli government to cease all of these actions, as they appear to be a violation of international law. And we're very concerned, and we hope that they, there is no harm or damage done to them or to their property. The Iranian government acknowledged some progress has been made in the talks with Western powers regarding the revival of the nuclear deal signed in 2015. Iranian officials pointed out that the talks resulted in breakthroughs in technical issues. However, they explained that the lifting of coercive measures, which is key to a return to the deal, has progressed very slowly. Tehran called on the United States to abandon a policy of pressure and blackmail with the purpose of correcting former President Donald Trump's mistakes. The Iranian executive has agreed on the possibility of a lasting short-term agreement if the United States, France and Germany show their political willingness. The government also highlighted it will not make any compromises overlooked in or absent from the original document's dispositions, which were disregarded by the United States when it unilaterally pulled out of the deal in 2018 and reimposed sanctions on Iran. And Iran's foreign ministry confirmed Monday that three Iranian diplomats arrived in Saudi Arabia to represent Iran in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, marking the first time that Saudi Arabia has received diplomats from Iran since 2016. The move demonstrates the possibility of reduced tensions between the Iranian and Saudi governments. Our focus is presently on reopening the offices of the Islamic Republic of Iran at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in Jeddah. Our diplomats were granted visas and it has been made possible for them to go to Saudi Arabia. Iran is ready to reopen its embassy in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, the onus is on Saudi Arabia to take practical steps in this regard. We have announced our preparedness before as well and will make any executive arrangements in this path to make this happen. Seven people were killed by security forces as thousands of Sudanese took to the streets to protest the military rule of the country. 
The latest killings bring the death toll of protesters killed since the October 25th coup, led by General Abdel Fattah al burhan to 71. Security forces used tear gas against the crowd in the capital, Khartoum, while another rally took place in Wad Madani in the south of the country. The move prevented the protesters from reaching the presidential palace, as many suffered breathing difficulties and injuries. A visit by United States diplomats is set for a nearby date, supposedly seeking to establish talks with the ruling faction on the matter of a transitional period, as the international community presses for a return to civilian rule. Former President of Mali, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, died at the age of 76 in Bamako, capital of the West African country, on Sunday. Keita led the nation from 2013 to 2020 when he was ousted in a coup that gave way to a military junta currently under regional sanctions for failing to restore civilian rule. The interim government issued a statement hailing the memory of Keita, who died after a long illness, according to the official report. The presidents of neighbouring countries Senegal and Niger expressed their admiration for the late head of state as a cultured man, a great patriot and a pan-Africanist. Malian politicians and activists travelled to Keita's home southwest of Bamako to pay their respects, with police guarding the entrance. I think that this is a great loss of role model for Malian youth, for the Malian people. But as they say, we believe that every time God closes a door, he opens another door. Mali and the Malians have just lost a worthy son of this country, their president, a man who had Mali in his bones, a man who loved this country deeply, a great statesman, a Republican, and a father to me. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of the stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.